What's hot in learning in 2023? What's going on with the learning systems market? You need to know these things. So I talked to the people who have the answers. Welcome to The Learning Hack, a podcast about the people and technologies that are creating the future of learning. I'm John Helmer. Now guess what? Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is cool. Learning is fun. And knowledge is power. Knowledge. Education. Learning. Welcome to this bonus episode of The Learning Hack, recorded at Learning Technologies France. The show is run by Closer Still Media, who also organise Learning Technologies London, and this year featured the launch of not one, but two important pieces of research that have become annual fixtures in the learning calendar and are hotly awaited each year. Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Fact, tell us more. Hack Facts. The L&D Global Sentiment Survey, run by Donald H. Taylor, takes the pulse of the L&D community worldwide. The one-minute online poll asks L&D professionals internationally what they think will be hot in the following year. The Fosway 9-grid report for learning systems is a multi-dimensional model that can be used to understand the relative position of solutions and providers, predominantly within the UK and European market. It allows you to compare different solutions based on their performance, potential, market presence, total cost of ownership and future trajectories across the market. People pay a lot of attention to both these reports, so it's a bit of an event when one of them gets launched. But both of them, at one show, wow! So I jumped at the opportunity to interview Don Taylor, who's chair of the Learning Technologies Conference, and David Wilson, CEO of Fosway. Both have been on the podcast before, and it was great to meet up with them again. So here are both of the interviews, starting with Don Taylor. Don Taylor, it's a year since you last appeared on The Learning Hack, and that time we discussed the results of your global L&D survey, your famous global L&D survey, which asks one basic question, what will be hot in 2023? So what's changed since last year? Firstly, I've got to point out a slight nuance that's really important, John. It's the Global Sentiment Survey. There are lots of surveys out there. I don't pretend this tells us what's actually going to happen. It tells us how people feel about things. I think as we talk, it'll become clear why that's an important nuance. So what's changed this year? Well, one of the key things that's changed is that AI, which was following the normal trajectory of everybody's thinking and the normal trajectory of every option on this, which is a decline over the years, has bounced back enormously this year. It is suddenly the topic everybody's talking about. And skilling and upskilling, very topical stuff. Has that changed since last year? Well, two years ago, it was new on the survey and it came in at number one uh, at an enormous score of 13%. It dropped down to 12.5% last year. This year, it's down to 12.2%. But it's really important, John, to remember that this is an aggregate score of something like 4,000 people across 100 countries. And the way people feel about that, that 12.2% is very different across a range of different countries. So it's not as if it dominates thinking in the way it did two years ago. Two years ago, everybody was agreed that reskilling and upskilling was the hot topic. Now, that ain't so. Ah, uh, that's interesting. So you've got reskilling and upskilling at number one. You've got skills based talent management at number three. You go to all the stands at this show, everybody is talking about skills. Yep. It feels like skills is a dominant issue, but you're saying it's not perhaps as dominant as it looks? Let's, I think we have to look at the nuance of the wording here. So I ask people what's hot. We know from looking at the results of this survey over 10 years that people are very influenced by what I call the, the wordscape that they're in. The wordscape is the words that are floating around them, particularly at the time they're doing the survey. And reskilling, upskilling was a phrase that was extremely hot for about two years before it became hot on our survey three years ago. So everyone was talking about it. You couldn't escape it. I think what's happened is the general idea that we need to get people new skills to accommodate, firstly, 
automation, which was the first reason for it, and then secondly, a life after COVID. I think that's more or less been accepted as an idea. Now people say, well, how do we do it? So as reskilling, upskilling is slowly on the way down, it still tops the table, but it's on the way down. What's happened instead is that we've now moved to an idea of the practicalities of it. All right, we need to give people new skills. How do we do it? And I think that's where the rise of skills-based talent management up the table comes from. And skills has, had, has been fairly dominant over the last few years, as you say, though it may be slight fading. Is it unusual for, I mean, this survey has been running for 10 years, okay? Is it unusual for it to be dominated by something which has got such external causes in I don't know, macroeconomics, demographics, perhaps even uh, geopolitics as the, the skills crisis? It's a great question. I would say the issue is partly that. I think the real issue here probably is that reskilling and upskilling is a really wide general term. And of course, everyone's going to, if people aren't quite sure what to vote for, they might opt for it as like their third choice and so it, it so it's like the common denominator everyone goes for whereas there's a strong correlation between people voting for for example skills-based talent management and ai those two tend to be grouped together and also ai and personalization whereas i kind of looking at the numbers looks to me like reskilling upskilling tends to be like the the low risk option to include and it's a, it's a very general thing, whereas other things are much more specific. And I think that's one reason it's been at the top. Now, in the past, the tables have been dominated by personalization or collaboration. Those two have generally fought to be top of the table. They're both on the way down. I predict, and it's always dangerous, but I predict the risk of the upskill will not be top of the table next year. We'll have to see what it will be, but it could be AI. On its performance this year, it could be AI. Okay. Well, if, yes. I mean, if uh, like the UK government managed to... To bully all those over 50s back into the workforce and, you know, people start shooting out babies or uh, leaving university and getting jobs, whatever, perhaps the, the skills gap gets closed and thanks for that. <laughs> well, let's get on to AI. Um, AI at number two and also showing up in personalization um, and adaptive delivery, which are, of course are AI driven. It's been big this year. Is that all down to chat GP, GPT? I mean, chat G GPT, when you talk to serious AI, AI people, they say, well, you know, this stuff's been around for a while. Yep. There are a lot of different models of it. Everybody, you know, Google's got one. It's not like Microsoft OpenAI is the only game in town. What has really driven this is the fact that there's a kind of consumer-friendly interface, if you like, that's free. So for years, it's been a case of, yeah, I really want to get some AI. I'm going to have to get some, you know, 25-year-olds um, into my company and, and, and get them to do it and put them down the hall where they're not going to disturb everybody yeah. um, with their cultural differences and all the rest of it. Now, suddenly, it's there for any old marketing manager to go on and say, you know, write me a blog post about skills. Um, which of course we've all done, and and that is the thing that's made it into a meme that's made it go viral. So, is, are we seeing that in these results? Is that why AI is figuring so highly? I think there's two things around this rise of AI, and and by the way, it has risen extraordinarily. So it was last year it was at position twelve, and it's come back up to position two on the table, and it's jumped up four point five percent. Firstly, when things are on a downward trend on the survey, they never kick it back up at all when they start going down they tend to keep going down so to come up at all is extraordinary to come up by 4.5 percent is absolutely unheard of so it's a very real jump you're absolutely right that chat gpt is behind a lot of this we know that people respond to yeah the wordscape they're in the wordscape was all about ai and chat gpt just as we were going into the survey on a smaller scale we saw this last year when Per Lager wrote a book called Reskill Op Upskill in Sweden, which came out a couple of months before the survey. Sweden previously had always voted for collaboration and social learning as their number one, but that year they all voted for reskilling upskilling and not by a small margin. It was the country with the largest vote for reskilling upskilling in the world because of that book. So we respond, we respond to the words and the ideas around us. And that was exactly what drove the interest in reskilling upskilling. So there's a lot of froth. There's a lot of superficial interest in AI. And it's driven by the fact, not that there has been a fundamental advance, 
but rather, as you say, there's a human ready to go into pace. The other thing that's happening, John, and this is really yep. important, the other thing that's happening... This is so great. That was a yes-no question. You could have given a yes-no answer. But, Don, you're so good, I, I will risk it with you. No, I would never do that with another interviewee. And you're going to give some more. The other thing that's happening is that it's not confined to L&D, and this is really important. With reskilling and upskilling, everybody was talking about it. It was the World Economic Forum in particular was kicking this off uh, in January uh, 2019 had a paper about reskilling upskilling, which just caused an avalanche of other papers around this. And you had conferences talking about it, and it was about policy, it was about a, a wide range of things, and not just about L&D at all. The same things happened with GPT. In particular, the marketing people have got super excited about chat GPT, and of course, being marketing people, they're talking about it with everyone. So you can't go on LinkedIn without a series of articles, posts, carousels about the top prompts you should use, uh, the prompts probably to get the prompts to use with ChatGPT. And of course, L&D people are thinking, my God, my job is over. Or not. They may be thinking about ways you can use it creatively. But AI has moved from being something that was ethereal and beyond reach to something that's absolutely at your doorstep and is changing people's work right now. So that's why it's in people's minds. Now, the question was... Is it just about ChatGPT? And I don't think it is. I think there's ChatGPT plus as an effect, if you like. So undoubtedly, that huge kicker to AI is down to ChatGPT. But look at what the other stuff that's come up as well. Skills-based talent management is up and learning analytics is up as well. And both of these are up from their positions last year. And again, as I said earlier, it is very unusual for anything to come up when it's been going down. Now, skills-based talent management was new last year. It's making the sort of ascent up the table which you would expect for something that's new and interesting. So it's a new trend. It's undoubtedly important. But learning analytics was on its way down and it had another kicker. So it was on position five last year. It's up to four this year. And it's come back up as part of a general interest in the power of AI. For me, John, this is part of a much bigger process. What's happened is in 2020, I said, probably unwisely, it's the year of data. Learning development is understanding that data is important. Learning analytics was uh, number one. AI was there. Everyone was talking about what we can do. Then we had the pandemic. During the pandemic, the results were all about being in touch with people. The high scoring options were collaboration, coaching, mentoring. Those were the things that rose up. Everything else was on the way down. Now we're out of the pandemic-ish People are taking stock. It's almost like they're saying, all right, we're going to put that stuff to one side and we were going to go back to the data. We're going back to the numbers. That is like a three, four year trend is what I'm seeing. All right. So you can sort of see the influence of AI, not just in that specific number two category, but throughout the kind of top 10, as it were. Absolutely. And, and I do remember for, for ages, our AI was sort of bubbling under as a topic, you know, as a blogger, I've written about it for, for yonks. But it, it felt distant, whereas now, as you say, we're all kind of tripping over it. So let's turn now to something which is perhaps in the position that AI was a while ago, in that everybody's talked about a lot about it, but it ain't a lot happening. And that's the metaverse. And I think that that's new in this year. This was your choice. I'm not going to rub this in. <laughs> But it's looking like it's in the relegation zone, isn't oh, it? Oh, my Lord. I, you know, I pride myself on picking the stuff that's going to be hot. I'm a, I'm a trend watcher. What's going on? Normally, I'm pretty good, right? On average, when I choose a new option, it comes in at 7.2%. This is very consistent. It will come in at around that, and then it will go up for a year or two. I like to think if I'd chosen Metaverse last year, well, it would have performed quite well. Everyone was talking about it. There was a lot of fuss. Well, in the run-up to the survey, we had news of huge layoffs in Facebook. Microsoft wiping out its entire uh, VR division. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just not something anybody's talking about right now. And it, it scored a miserable 2-point-something percent. And I, I hang my head in shame for having chosen 2.5%. I hang my head in shame for having chosen the metaverse thinking it might pick up it was the bad choice this year let's see how it performs next year uh, my view is it will it will stumble off a bit like i think eight years ago i chose wearables yeah no that was yeah. a disaster it's, it's it's in the wearables category yeah i talked about metaverse wearables <laughs> google glass terrible second life all all awful failures but but the metaverse so 
What kind of made me think differently about the metaverse was interviewing Stephen Downs yep. for the Learning Hack podcast. And he has a very cogent way that he puts the metaverse together with blockchain and artificial intelligence that made sense of it for me. But it also made me think what it said was that what's different between VR and the metaverse is that in the metaverse, things have persistence. Yep. And blockchain is the thing which will give them that persistence. Now, at the moment, things don't have persistence. Nobody kind of has, has laid down uh, uh, the rail tracks, if you like, uh, like the internet, which came out of public bodies. We don't have anything like that. We have um, Meta making a land grab, as you say, cutting their funding. The metaverse doesn't actually exist. So for hard-pressed L&D people, I think they'd probably this year take a look at that and say, well, it ain't here. So, and I've got all these other things, these skills yeah. gap issues I have to deal with. I'm not going to be too bothered about the metaverse. I don't think anyone else is either. Does that sound right? I mean, my view of the metaverse, and I'm not an expert on it, is that it's, a, it's an idea which is very exciting, but is ill-formed. I'm not saying it can't be defined. It can be but there are a number of different definitions for it, and people don't have a unified view of what it means. I think that the idea of permanence, or, or lack of permanence in the metaverse, is absolutely crucial. With your mobile phone, you can choose to use it or not, to be in contact with other people. When you, when you get in touch with them, synchronously or asynchronously, they are there. So you send the people a message, or you call them, they get back to you either immediately or they're there um, later when it's convenient for them. I like to think of the metaverse eventually will be a bit like that. We'll slip into it. We'll be there virtually. We'll be interacting with other people, people who are alive or dead, people who are real or virtual, content that is attached and, and facilitated by a person or is generated by AI. And I feel sure that will happen, but we are a long way from that yet. And so at the moment, the metaverse, well, the, the apparatus we associate with the metaverse, for me, is the, of the, the, the apparatus of virtual reality. And that's absolutely fine. That's very useful, but it's not the metaverse. I like to think that eventually the metaverse will be a bit like traditionally how we would communicate with our or see our ancestors, that we would see our ancestors as being a permanent part of our lives, even though they weren't there anymore. And we could, we could touch them with them, either going through a shaman or going through a wise man or a wise woman. And it would be part of the way we thought about the world in addition to it, alongside it. I believe eventually we'll get to that sense of the metaverse. I appreciate this is a bit, sounds a bit outworldly, but I think that is eventually how we'll get to it. But we're a long way from being there yet. It's not comfortable enough technically. And that idea of you say of permanence, that isn't there. That for me is the foundation stone for a successful metaverse. Yeah, not so much permanence because nothing is permanent, as, as you know, but persistence. Uh, persistence. Yeah, yeah, I think the idea is that, you know, if I, if I do a load of learning in a, a metaverse training platform at my company, then I leave and get a better job, go somewhere else. They might be using a different platform and it doesn't know what I did at the last company, it doesn't know what yeah. my skill level is. You yeah. know, the dream is that you you have persistence of, of, of that information and data and, and so the whole thing kind of joins up. So either somebody has to win, there has to be one kind of yeah. like Microsoft that, that does everything, or else there have to be has to be a sound of like scorn but a bit smart. I'm not I'm less convinced by the idea of persistence across platforms being the defining use case for it in sense of it being providing other people with information about us but i think persistence in terms of it being useful for us as being the sense that it's always there for us i think is the use case it's, it's kind of abstruse probably we should move on to something else on this survey well how does v how has vr done this time it's not done okay so look, vr vr is a great example of an option and remember right at the beginning i said this is about sentiment right yeah it's not about what's actually happening. It's about how people feel about things. And that's a crucial mm. definition because people can be very excited about stuff that doesn't have any bearing, right? Okay, so we have virtual reality and it had followed almost exactly the same line as artificial intelligence. You start off low, you come up to a hype point and then you start fading away. And for the last two years, VR and AI were at pretty much the same points on the table with the same score. And they were on their way out. This year, VR followed the predicted trend, continuing going downwards. AI had that huge bounce back. The difference is that AI was utterly exceptional. VR, VR fits into the established trend, which is excitement tapering away. And there's two reasons for doing that. One is that it just becomes business as usual. And that's quite normal. Something You're doing something. It's exciting at the beginning. Mobile learning or mobile delivery topped the table 10 years ago. It is now at the bottom of the chart. 
the same thing is true of VR. So VR is actually something that is entering the mainstream. The question is, what's hot? Not, you know, what are you using? <laughs> the question is, what's hot? And it's not hot because, well, it's kind of stuff that we know has its place. And so people are using it for good reason. And there's lots of great news about VR. Hardware has come down. The skills base of people able to deal with it is massively wider than it was three or four years ago. The amount of content that's available is far wider. People's acceptance and the idea that they would use VR is far wider, thanks in large part to gaming and, and, and the breadth of adoption. So there's lots of good news about VR, but of course that also means, yeah, it ain't hot anymore. It's just something that's now a bit more part of the furniture. Yeah, and some there are some interesting use cases, yeah. like the Make Real story about kind of um, diversity and inclusion that we covered on the Learning Hack podcast. But I'd say, John, I'd say that precisely because there are interesting use cases about it, yeah. that probably indicates that its period of, of hype and excitement and hotness has gone. So it's now into use and experimentation and development. So let's move on to uh, another area. You, when you presented these results uh, yesterday here at the show, you gave very interesting regional breakdowns, obviously weighted slightly towards France because that's where we are. One thing I'd like to pick up on in terms of uh, your slicing and dicing is the US. You said that the US is always a leader in setting trends, which is interesting because it, in a way it's a longitudinal study, isn't it? And one thing you can see is that, you know, what the US is sneezing about at the moment, we're all going to catch that cold, you know. Sorry, bad metaphor at the time <laughs> of COVID, isn't it? But you know what I mean? You know, the US leads and in uh, years to come, we, we will be following those those trends. So what does this table tell us about that? What's the US getting excited about that we will be getting excited about? The US remains the excited about reskilling and upskilling. No question about it. Uh, and so we shouldn't dismiss that just yet. But it is less excited about reskilling and upskilling than any other of the eight geographies. So and the score for it in the US was 10.9%. What really rose the score, and these are the preliminary numbers, but I'm pretty sure that will say the same for the US. What really bumped up the score for reskilling and upskilling this year was a huge vote for it from Malaysia. Uh, and we had, we had something like 200, 300 people voting for Malaysia. That was a big lift. And that's for very good reasons locally. So if the US is less interested in that, what is it interested in? It's very interested in AI. Uh, so it's, it's more interested in AI than it is in reskilling and upskilling. And I think we can see that interest crossing across to the rest of the globe continuing which is why i was saying earlier i think there's a chance that ai is not just a flash in the pan this year but may persist next year i'm thinking back to uh, micro learning when the us was wild about that in 2016 yeah. interest died away but in uh, 2017 the rest of the world right. was super interested in it and that's a pattern we've seen time and again one thing that i wouldn't predict spreading from the us to the rest of the world necessarily is the persistent preference in North America for personalization above collaboration. Okay. Since 2017, uh, North, the North, North America and the US in particular has always voted more for personalization slash adaptive learning than collaborative slash social learning. And that is utterly consistent. Whereas in Brazil, and we've only had big numbers from Brazil for three years, yeah. but in Brazil, it is utterly consistent that it's the other way around. They right. always, always rank collaborative learning above everything else. And their interest, for example, in reskilling upskilling was much lower this year, 9.5% in South America. Interest in AI in South America was below 6%. So in the North and the South continent of the Americas, really stark differences in perception. Okay, interesting. I blame it on Ayn Rand. Or is it Ayn Rand? <laughs> um, yeah, are you going to have to do a separate podcast? Maybe you've already done one with Donald, I know, on, <laughs> on Ayn Rand. On Maybe, yeah. you have. I don't think we touch with a barge of poverty. So lastly, I want to kind of sum up from that, that though you, you can look at this and say that skills is the big story here, but it's not. What, what's emerged as a theme here and what you're telling me is that artificial intelligence is really the big story that, that, that you're seeing here. But to move on to something else that we're not talking about so much now, um, the, the pandemic which kind of showed up in the, the results over the last couple of years. Uh, we, we've kind of moved into a post-pandemic phase. I uh, wouldn't say it's over. Is that reflected in this? Is, is this the return to a pre-pandemic world? 
that's a really good point, and I think that is the theme. The theme is that I like the idea of post-pandemic in the sense post-pandemic phase in the sense that it's not over, yeah. but the thinking has changed. I think that's accurate. I do think that we are in a different world compared with where we were. Collaboration, social learning is down. It was number two last year. It's down to five this year. Coaching, mentoring, four last year, down to seven. These are big changes. And I think they are down to the sense that during the pandemic or immediately after it, people wanted human contact. And I think that sense isn't being reflected now in the survey. Remember, it's about sentiment. That sentiment's not being picked up. But the other thing that is interesting, John, and this gives me great heart with learning development, is that there are there are two options which don't follow the usual pattern of things getting exciting and then falling away. And this is showing value and consulting more deeply with the business, which have regularly been between five and a half and seven and a half percent. And in fact, for the past four years, have risen pretty regularly year on year by a small amount and i take heart with the fact that that consistently has been important to people and seems to be a slowly increasing importance to people it suggests to me that there is a widespread view in the learning and development profession that yeah we need to do this stuff properly it is by no means consistent across geographies and there are really wide variations with those between uh, almost any nation you can find but i'm very happy that overall it seems to be slowly budging its way up the table. Okay, going to have to wrap it up now. Um, going to get, let go one have their stand back. Um, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to do this, Don, yet again, um, and, and all the help you've given the, the, the podcast. Thanks a lot. Always a delight. Always a delight, John. Thank you. So I'm here uh, at the Learning Technologies France show talking to David Wilson of Fosway, who has launched his Nine Grid for Learning systems very recently. So David, the new Nine Grid for Learning, what's it tell us about the learning systems market at the moment and um, how much has that changed from last year? So, I mean, first of all, as you said, the, 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 the learning grid, the nine grid we've just announced this week is for learning systems, not for digital learning, which we, yep. we will announce later in, in the year, in um, end of March, hopefully. So the learning systems, um, nine grid is really focused at software and platform companies. So typically the people providing the LMSs, the LXPs, the learning suites of this world, etc. And I think the simple answer overall is it's a very, the market's been very healthy. There's a lot of growth and lots of changes, lots of new entrants. I think we added about another seven or eight, at least, new players into the market, looking across some of the European markets and who's trying to step up and play internationally as well. So there's there's a lot of change going on in the market. And that, other, of course, the big obvious thing is at the top end with Cornerstone buying some total and uh, Edcast as well. There's also changes and consolidation going on as well. Was there anything that really surprised you about the way that it had changed this year from last year? So on one level, the you know the mid market continues to really grow a lot, and there's there's a, quite a lot of innovation and people within there. So what you might look as a mid band across the nine grid, both in terms of the established sort of leaders at that level, but also um, you know the new entrants and people trying to play in that space. I suppose the um, you know at the top end, really, it's around actually the number of organizations that really are able to step up to be truly large enterprise, truly global scale, continues to be a challenge. You know, there's there's still not a lot of breakthrough happening there. There's a little bit around it. And in some ways, the bigger influence of that is still from um, the HCM and the cloud HR market with companies like Workday and SAP, et cetera. Um, we put IMC up there who are a German systems company who've been very around for a very long time, yeah, but do a lot of interesting years, work yes. as well. And then. So the sort of players, you know, sort of uh, Decebo continues to work, you know, develop very well, um, growing the business. Now, for, for us, we always saw Amir as the sort of neglected child for them or their origins, really. But it was actually the neglected part of their business that's now changing um, and that's growing, growing effectively as well. And then obviously new companies like 360 Learning from France, obviously we're in Paris at the moment. Yeah. We're really starting to step up or try and step up to that next level. Part of the difficulty of what you do is, you know, the taxonomy of it in, a, in an emerging industry. And occasionally that gets put under pressure. So, you know, whether decisions over whether someone goes into this grid or another grid, about how you describe them. You, a, a while ago, you had this change from, you introduced a category of specialists. 
yeah. as opposed yeah. to suites and divided them like yeah. that. And that's obviously the result of the markets changing, what people are giving and, and providing is changing and we have to make a change. Is there any change that's happened over the last few years that's, that, that you feel is kind of busting the, the parameters of how you look at stuff? Well, we, we reevaluate it every year. And also, you know, for us, learning systems is just one of the five nine grid areas. So some of these topics like skills, for example, we're looking at multidimensionally from different parts of the portfolio. I mean, the, the suite and specialist kind of narrative, I think, in some ways feels even stronger now than it did when we made the transition. Yeah. Partly what happened there was we were looking at, you know, what was a potentially a very strong emerging segment around learning experience, right? And, the, yeah. uh, and LXPs. The reality is what we saw when we looked at them is the LXPs were typically, in many cases, LMSs that were trying not to be positioned as LMSs. They were trying to be more, more modern, more contemporary, you know, more Netflix style interface, AI recommendations yeah. and all this kind of stuff. But to some degree, they were still solving similar problems. And then there were some players within that space who were clearly just focusing on the experience layer. Now, it actually turned out that not many of the LXPs were really just doing that. Yeah. So Degreed is a really good example. You know, we've just moved Degreed this year into Strategic Leader, yeah. which is like a very significant shift. But Degreed, even though it was sort of one of the poster child players for yeah, the yeah. LXP market, in reality was a skills platform, skills development platform. Right. That's really where they were focusing around. But they didn't come from a traditional learning management module. But what they had to do is then almost backfill some of that functionality in order to be able to solve those problems. So what we found was We've deconstructed the learning experience story and Fiona, who was lead analyst on learning systems and I, we did a load of work with this actually over probably two years in total. Yeah. It's really trying to rip it apart and understand what that was about. And that identified a number of specialisms, which were spaces that we really felt were being disruptive. So come back to your mm -hmm. question, what was really being disruptive? So clearly changing the learning experience and moving away from catalog driven. LMS plus content. Yeah, admin driven delivery. kind yeah. of learning well, of course, was one piece of it. But the other one was the growth of mobile, right? Mobile became a dominant device. Video became quite dominant from a content point of view. Yeah. Intelligence and AI, you know, there was a lot about building intelligence and personalizing learning and recommendations in there and so on. Mm. Um, and also around collaboration, you know, collaboration for us, for Fosway is an old theme. You know, we've looked at how basically when you do high value learning, pretty much in most cases that involves collaboration between learners, right? right. And collaboration intimate to a programmatic learning model. Okay. And, and, and that was, again, it's an area where those that's not an LXP. That's not what an LXP does. But at the end of the day, some of the solutions in that space were being positioned like that. Yeah. So in reality, talking about, you know, a modern learning suite, which was trying to be the backbone for most organizations, you know, that was a suite was covering off most of their main pieces. And then around that, looking for where did we need disruption? whether yeah. that was around experience or intelligence or collaboration or mobile. What for you did you need to be best at and ahead of where the suites were? That's where you bought it. And that ultimately becomes an ecosystem story, right? And I'm sure we'll talk about that a bit later on. Yeah. That is ultimately what we're seeing happening in the market. When you look at what's happening ultimately is you see new players come in as specialists. Many of them try and be disruptive around a specialism and then at some point transpose to becoming a suite. So 360 Learning is actually a good example in Paris. Yeah. Their orientation initially was around collaborative learning, right? So that was a big thing for them, mm. was around being um, a collaborative process, collaborative content creation and so on. But as they have tried to own more of the real estate, yeah. they have to become the suite as well. Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about ecosystems now, because one of, one of the um, words you use, which feels very clumsy in, in the mouth as you acknowledge, ecosystemness yeah and yet it has come up in a couple of talks i've seen you do and it's a, perhaps really a better way to describe it but actually it's a very important thing now isn't it it's massively fundamental right and and actually so if i explain the origin yes. around that so again when we were deconstructing the learning experience in the lxp story one of the things we realized was a key role of some of these systems was connecting, being the connective tissue mm. that pulled content and learning from wherever it was, right? It's a key role that often people talked about the LXP as being. So there were two pieces of that. One was how did they put the shop window together? 
Yeah. How did they collectively do that and enable you to filter and find personalized recommendations and all this kind of stuff? But the other bit is how did I suck all this stuff from all these different places and make it available in one place without having to go in and log in and register and integrate and all these kinds of things. Mm. So what we realized was that there was a fundamental piece of this whole model and it's always been true in learning technology architecture. The LMS was never the only answer. It was yeah. always authoring tools. There was always virtual classroom, always assessment platforms and so on. Yeah. And typically there were multiple of some of those, right? So it was always about an ecosystem. Because Fosway looks at also this stuff, not just from a learning only lens, but also from a talent lens, from, a, from an HR lens and so on. What also became obvi obvious was that the ecosystem is not just about learning, right? It's also about HR. It's also about talent processes and so on. So, on. Mm. so at the end of the day, ecosystem is fundamental to what we're trying to do. The issue is who recognizes it, right? And, yeah. and one of the challenges that buyers often have is they overbuy the one, so one thing is going to solve all their problems, right? That's never going to be true. And mm. it's just as true if it's an HCM suite like uh, Workday or SAP, as if it's or it's a learning suite like Cornerstone or PeopleFluent or Talentsoft or whatever it's going to be. So. You know, at the end of the day, they, we talk about them as being anchor pillars and suites. Yeah. But you still have to be able to connect the tissue around it. Yeah. You talk, I think, John, quite a lot around partnering. And yeah. It's really obvious now that a lot of the vendors have been successful because they can partner. So let, let me explain why we call it ecosystemness, right? Yes. And it's a word yes. I came up with, right? Yeah. Because when you talk about that in a technical dialogue, people will start talking to you about terms like integration, interoperability, APIs, and so yeah. on. Okay. And, and that's great at some level. When you look at some of the solutions that are good at this, they don't just have APIs, they have connectors. So they have pre-built connectors that you can just turn on. Mm. And I think the problem is with integration is you have to have people that do integration. So if you are yeah. buying an LMS from one vendor and a tool from somebody else and a specialist solution for mobile learning from somebody else, you have to connect the dots together. Yeah. Right? Now, for large enterprises, they're used to this, right? But they hate it. It costs them a fortune to do, yeah. and it always fails. It's always a problem. For the mid-market, nobody's got any budget for it. Nobody's got an integration team. So I can give you a set of APIs, but what the hell am I supposed to do with them without right. an integration team? So what we started to do was going, well, first of all, connecting across the ecosystem is critical. Yeah. But what is more important is being able to do that uh, press our button. Yeah. So ecosystemness is the characteristic of how good you are at playing in the ecosystem. Mm. I, I wanted to pick a word that felt, even though you're right, it's clumsy. It felt just like it was very wasn't contrived. Yes. Right. If I talk about interoperability, people glaze over and go, yeah, "What the hell yeah. do you mean?" Terrible. Actually, it's about if you are selling a solution into the market, how well do you plug into the wider customer ecosystem automatically? Right. I want to be able to put a, press a button and to know that I can pull the data from there, pass the workflow to there, whatever mm -hmm. it's going to be. I want it to be seamless. I want to be able to appear in my experience layer piece and know it works. Yeah. So it turns out to be almost one of the most important characteristics within that deconstructed view around what experience is. Yeah. And secondly, it turns out to be massively differentiating. Some of the vendors are just not very good at it. Yeah. Others really get it and are building, have built marketplaces with things like one click connector. Yeah. So you literally come in and say, all right, I want to add that. I press a button and the next thing I know is I've populated all the data through. It's live, it's already working, right? Mm. You can't get any easier than that. So that's why ecosystemness is how good are you at playing in the ecosystem? Yeah. That's true within learning and it's true between learning and HR and talent. Is it more important in the mid market? It's utterly critical in the mid market mm. because otherwise you have to buy one thing that does everything. Right? Yeah. To some degree, that sounds an attractive idea, but it also means that you're probably condemned to mediocrity around things that you actually really think matter. Hmm. Kind of interesting, we get in these conversations a lot around suites strategically and versus specialists as well, is you know where's good enough good enough, if yeah. I can put it in those terms. And the answer is where you don't want to be best. Right? If you want to be best at that, yeah. if you need to be best at mobile learning, you know, taking a generic, learning system suite that is okay at mobile learning is not going to be good enough. You have to be able to be disruptive. And then in which case, how do I get those things to coexist, right? 
right. because generally when you go with specialists, they don't solve all the other problems, yeah. which is why the LXPs have really kind of marginalized in terms of their proposition, mm. as much as learning experience has become more strategic as a topic. So yeah, mm. it's a really critical thing. In the main market, it's non-negotiable because if you nobody's got a budget to pay for it, they want it out of the box for free. They don't want to, to integrate. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's one of those things, e ecosystemness, that you, you, you kind of hear it in one of your talks. And then I found as I'm walking around talking to vendors at the stands here at Learning Tech France, it keeps coming back in, in the back of my head when I'm talking to people. I mean, and you've got kind of quite extreme examples like, I'm going to get the name wrong here, is it LMS365? Five, yeah, plug. Who are actually, yep. the, the, it's all kind of integrating grid, with Microsoft. Exactly. It's built in Microsoft. Built in Teams, right. It's built, built in, in Office 365, plugs into Teams. Yeah. So that's a really good example. So the IT department love it. Yeah, they, so they, and yeah. that's obviously, they're a specific vendor that they specialize in that part of the market. Should say, actually, neither of us have sponsorship from, well, that's I don't know about exactly. you, but I, I mean, I'm not sponsored not, by LMS 365. Um, this that's is why a, I try and talk yeah. about oh, Almost everybody, right? Because yeah, at the yeah. end of the day, we can do that. That's the power we have as Fosway, right? We have that. We have the research and insight behind all of those things. Yeah. The other thing I was just talking about a little bit was Microsoft, right? Yeah. So one of the interesting things in this market now, particularly in the corporate space longer term, is Microsoft is now in the game, right? Because right. of Viva. So basically, they have a set of capabilities built on Teams, yeah. which is to build a whole set of services around employee experience, learning, and so on. Into, be, into Teams natively, right? So LMS365, example of vendor that plugs into that, mm. but so would Skillsoft's Percipio, so would SuccessFactor, so yeah. would Cornerstone, because nobody wants to be left behind, right? If you've got a big corporate entity who are running Teams, using Teams globally, using Office 365 globally, the last thing you want is to be you know, disintermediated from your yeah, prospect, yeah. right? Because you can't play in that world. So this is also a factor as well. And that's also, so it's not just about ecosystem in learning or ecosystem in HR, it's also ecosystem in work, right? Yeah. And that's a really good example where it comes into play. And so they snuck into the grid this time, have they on the, am I right, on the well, left-hand we, side? We've been tracking them for a while. You know, they're, they're um, a, like a high trajectory solid performer for us. Yeah. For, the, for a lot of these companies, it's about them, you know, to some degree how they step up, right? So there are examples, in fact, in most of the nine grids now, of specialists who are strategic leaders. So in uh, learning systems, a really good example of that training orchestra. Yeah. Right, which is a completely different thing, right? It's not around what we're talking about. It's around, you know, instructor management, resource management, training management, reporting, finance management around that, et cetera. So typically a, something that a really big companies have to do. Yeah. And LMS is typically in the past haven't been great at doing. So mm. that's a really good example of if you were need to be best at that, maybe you're managing two hundred million dollars of spend, you know, globally. Funnily enough, you probably want to be quite good at that stuff. Yeah. In which case, how do you make that coexist in your ecosystem? And the answer is with a specialist solution that plugs in. Right. So we see disruptor solutions at all sorts of different levels around all parts of this spectrum. Okay. So we've talked about the kind of 2D aspect of what you do with the grid. You know, you have a grid and you're putting it over the market, trying to see what everybody does, how you position them, how it all kind of fits together. If you look in another dimension and put time into it. What I'm always interested in is, you know, every every year I kind of pick up the grid, look at it, oh yeah, 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 that's the market. I don't have as much of a sense as you and Fiona and David do of how that changes over time. Yeah. So if I ask, ask you to sort of think about that in, in quite a long time frame, like the last couple of decades, how would you characterize the way that the learning systems market particularly has developed. I mean, are we talking paradigms or is it more slow, gentle progress and suddenly, oops, it looks like something different? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, just to be really clear, we zero base this every year. Yeah. So we, we build a new functional model, typically, which is an evolution of the previous. We run a completely new, you know, functional capture process with all the vendors. We run briefings. We run everything, customer referencing. Yeah. We rebuild the whole thing each time. And one of the things that's interesting, so a nine grid is not a linear score. It's basically, what we do is we band it. So we talk about high, mid and low, right? Right. High, mid and low performance, high, mid and low potential, high, mid and low TCO. Each year, average within that is different, right? Okay. So what's one of the things that's interesting is, although sometimes people look at nine grid and think it hasn't changed, 
actually, every, because all the vendors have all added roadmap, they've all added functionality, if you just stayed the sill, you'd be going backwards. You'd have a negative trajectory, right. right? So you always have to keep up. And where you see people in a right or upper trajectory, or even a high right trajectory, what that means is they are accelerating relative to themselves and the market. Okay. okay? So if you just stay the same, you know, you go backwards. If you stay the same in terms of your trajectory, you stay in the middle. If you go accelerate your trajectory, you go right. So that's one of the reasons when people look at it and go, well, it hasn't changed. The answer is you missed the point, right? If, mm. if they've stayed in the same, that means they've maintained a trajectory in line with the rest of the market. And we have a whole bunch of really deep functional storing stuff behind a lot of this as well, which we also use, for example, to help corporates make decisions about who maybe the right fit for them is and so on. If somebody stays the same on the function, score they'll go backwards as a percentage of average right so right. that's a critical piece the other bit that changes is what we functionally include also gets upgraded over time so yeah. one of the obvious things that we did having deconstructed learning experience into a bunch of these different specialism areas last year we, what we did is we reverse engineered those back into the model. So in 2022, the functional model for the learning systems line grid was massively different mm. because we re-injected mobile intelligence, collaborative, inter all these things into it, experience into it, and redefined what the model was. So this year, what we've done is updated other things. So extended enterprise is an area where we've seen a lot of growth in companies thinking about how they disrupt ex um, in the extended enterprise, right? So Yeah, players like the chain yeah, back. And it's, yeah. it's really important because, you know, training staff is one thing, training customers and partners is business critical. Yeah. So it's an area where, again, the functional model has changed. That model is being used to assess every vendor, right? And, and as part of that process. So it's always moving forward every year. Yeah. The other obvious thing you see is changes. So sometimes this year we had a, a quite slight criteria shift around the size of an organization. There's a couple of organizations which we've historically been really interested in, people like Filtered and Anders Pink, that were plugins really to other people's yeah. systems, which we really felt we couldn't really can sustain including them in having, even though we feel really positive about what they can do. Obviously, mm. Anders Pink just been announced by, by Go1, yeah. et cetera. Uh, and then there's obviously new players from different markets, you know, and then you see some, some of the Young Turks and some of the older ones, consolidation, as I said before, right? So every year it's different. Yeah. Every year the underlying calculation is completely zero based. Are you saying there that it's not then possible to kind of treat it as a longitudinal study and say, if you look back 20 years, how is it? Yeah, we I mean, can. It didn't sell in 20 years, but we have because we've got. I the know you're fighting data. shy of making big proclamations about, you know, some other analysts might not mention, sort of treat it a bit like archaeology. You know, we had the Cambrian layer and then we had the you know the lms days and the lxb era. Yeah, I mean, and now we're in the academies so era, but we find custom, you know. Corporates, of course, look at it and plot the path. All right. Vendors, of course, also plot the path for their own purposes, you know, internally. Hmm. But it's one of the reasons why we never overlay anything on the image. The image is the image, right? Nobody can touch the image. They can't change it. Right. In reality, behind the scenes, of course, we can do exactly what you just talked about. We can go back and tell you what that functional and launch directory of every vendor is. Yeah. And if we wanted to, we could reverse engineer it back into the current model to see how much they're moving forward. Mm. Right. So a part of the process, a key part of the, anal the analyst process is is really getting that sense of trajectory and change and what's really going on. The other thing, of course, we have to do, right? it's not just about the marketing hype. It's also about the customer reality. Right. So vendors can come out with a brand new module, whatever, but like, is anybody using it? You know, mm. what's real, what isn't, etc. So I think hopefully one of the things that, that you agree with is, you know, we've re we're, we're, we're trying to do really well at Fosway. It's not just like track the change and the advocacy, right? I mean, I think the number of these trends we've talked about way before they've ever happened. Yeah. But also to maybe the biggest advocate around some of this, this innovation and change. But also the biggest critic. Mm -hmm. We have to we have to hold the my, most objective lens because I need corporate buyers to look at this and also, or if they're engaging with us, the the data, the information we can provide them behind that. They have to look at that and actually make a buying decision that's going to help them be successful. Yeah. Right. You know, at the end of the day, everything else is kind of vanity around it. It's actually about what will drive your success, and that's one of the reasons why understanding that backstory is so critical. Uh, and that's, I guess it's also a message to your listeners a little bit, which yeah. is, you know, looking at a nine grid is just the top, the top of the top of the iceberg, right? Yeah. It's actually understanding behind it, what's behind it. 
And well, how is that relevant to you, your organization? Because no two com companies are the same. They might use some similar language to talk about some of their goals, but the moment you strip that back and talk about what really is important to them, mm. where are they spending money? What are their biggest challenges as a business? Effectively, the decisions they all make are contextual and specific. Yeah. So we can obviously help them map to that in a way that you can't ever do just reading a generic picture, you know, so. Yeah. I think it makes such an interesting contrast with uh, Don Taylor's global sentiment survey, yeah. because he, he, he's at pains to, to point out, he did, in the interview I just did with him, it's a sentiment survey. It's what people think is going to be hot. Yeah. And between the two of them, with it, you, you know, your nine grids and his sentiment survey, it is, there's a lot of contrast there with what people think are going to happen and then what they're actually using and what is driving value within their organizations. Well, also the other thing is we have what we call our realities research. So obviously there's a very specific process that you know, the nine grid processes yeah. are monsters in terms of the effort work, hundreds and thousands of hours of activity and effort. On parallel to that, we also have our trends research like you know, digital learning realities, HR realities and so on. And what we're doing there is at probably a lot more granular level than Don is from his sentiment survey, mm. is actually drilling into what companies are really trying to do now and what works and doesn't for them. And also, frankly, what they think of the vendors they're doing it with as well. Yeah. So some of this also applies into, into the nine grid process. But that also gives us a real sense of, you know, as I said, uh, I mean, I've done multiple things at Learning Technologies in London. We've here, I spoke here yesterday, just talking about how do you just blow apart the hype and work out what's real in all of this, okay? Mm. And that's not about intention, that's about reality, right? Yeah. And, and I think, um, hopefully, I think we try and, from a phosphate point of view, have that deepest, most insightful view of both what reality is in terms of the problems companies are trying to solve, but also who they're trying to solve them with and, what, what, and how good they are at doing it. And, that, and you know, hopefully that is, provides a lot of value to the market as a whole, not just to corporate buyers, but also to the wider market in terms of helping them understand what drives success. Yeah. And of course, Dodd survey is very much about the future. It's like what is going to be hot. Yeah. And yours is very much based on what has happened. Yeah. And there's some near term, right? I mean, there's a question I brought up yesterday, which is for, you know, what are the most strategic drivers for the people and HR function of the business they need to build in 2025, right? Mm. So that's, that's probably a, a whole step ahead in terms yeah. of it. But then you've also got these very specific things around, you know, which are the which are the technology parts of the stack? Which parts of the ecosystem are you most trying to disrupt this year? Are you spending more money or less? If you're spending, are you spending more money on technology or content or partners or ser you know services? Where are you trying to spend it, et cetera? All of those things. So there's a lot more grounded information. Mm. And then there's also a lot of, so there's a lot of validation information in there. But some of it's also very future looking as well. Ultimately, yeah. what's driving, what is driving things in your organization as a whole? That's the danger with a lot of the learning technology world. Yeah. It's in its own bubble. It's all about, you know, oh, it's still going to be about experience. It's all about skills. But the question is with what outcome and mm. for whom, right? Both for the employee, but also for the company, the organization that's paying for all of this stuff as well. Right. That's really, really critical. But in that contrast between these two different ways of looking at what, what's going on, taking the temperature of, of the market, Don's forward-looking sentiment-based thing and, and what you do with the nine grids. It's, what, what would be your reflection of what, what his survey is showing up this year is massive presence of AI in lots of different categories that is going to be hot. And going back a few years, we were saying, you know, it, it kind of bubbled around, but people actually weren't using it, whereas now we're all using AI um, increasingly. And of course, there's been a lot of hype around chat GPT. In terms of the actual use of AI in re reflected in the nine grid, what, what's your reflection on that? It's harder than people think. So I, again, my declared position on this, I spent the first seven years of my working life doing AI 35 years ago, right? So it's taken a long time to get where we are, but the speed of change now is huge. So effectively, there's a whole bunch of things that we want to do around personalization, skills, where things like AI and machine learning make a massive difference. We talk about chat, um, chat GPT, et cetera. The potential that can be really disruptive around it. There is a lot of anxiety within the, within the corporate world around 
um, you know, ethical AI, transparency, and so on. But the reality is these are all getting embedded. So from a supply side, on the vendor side, everybody is trying to embed this stuff in. And the reality is that that's quite hard to do. When you look at the vendors that were earliest on the AI bandwagon, go back five, six, seven years ago, in reality, it's only now are they really trying, starting to deliver quite profound things in the system. Now, the technology is massively accelerated. And obviously when companies are now teaming with, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, the open AI and the chat GBT or the, with Microsoft and Google and Amazon and their own AI engines, obviously their ability to leverage something now is massively different in the cloud than it was when they had to buy and build their own technology. Um, it's really important around skills inference and skills intelligence. It's really important around personalization, um, not just of recommendations, but also of the content itself yeah. um, and so on. So it, Adaptive, it's quite yeah. profound, but we're still in the early stages. Okay, so a little bit behind, but it probably is going to be hot. <laughs> well, it, it's, it will become much more pervasive. There are some challenges in doing that. And in some cases, we're running ahead of the proof point. And also there's concerns about, you know, fairness, for example, within it and transparency, yeah. which can, which if you're not careful, I mean, you know, there, there are horror stories out there of companies turning off recruiting AI systems because they were built on basically models that were built out of- uh, That reflect you know, how the, racist- the, the wrong, the yeah, a wrong them, yeah. What they considered a wrong demographic, right? So, yeah, yeah. so I think, you know, there's a lot of, there is a challenge there to do that, you know, transparency, ethics, and so on as well is really important. I think corporates are, they understand that this is a direction that ultimately they will almost have no choice but to go. Yeah. But they're also to some degree nervous around like making that forward. So actually what we're seeing is a much faster infection of AI into the supply side than we are on the buyer. And right. and I think from that from that perspective, in, in some ways the buyer will lag, but it will there will almost be no choice but to go that direction. Thank you, David. I won't take up any more of your time, uh, although we could talk all afternoon. Um, we have to move on. Thank you very much for participating and giving your time. Lovely to speak to you, as always. And you. Cheers. Thanks. That's all on the Learning Hack podcast for this time. Many thanks to our guest and to our sponsors and patrons. The Learning Hack is completely independent and transparently funded by sponsorship and your Patreon contributions. If you want to help others find us, please like, follow, rate, review and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice or on YouTube. And you can contribute at patreon.com forward slash learning hack. Now I finally get it.